it's very easy for me to talk about uh, creativity and innovation because I've had an interest in it for, for years. But my boss said, hey, actually, that's not good enough. Give them something that they can take away. Give them something that they can do themselves. And who knows, wouldn't it be great if they actually took something away that they could use and actually help build their own creative culture? So with that in mind, with that kind of challenge, I don't know about you, but I generally kind of get a white sheet of paper and I start doing some brainstorming and start doing some squiggles. And uh, following on from that, I, I kind of generally start with, as Simon Sinnott says, um, start with why. And why is innovation important? Why is creativity the building block? And the simple answer is, as everyone knows, it's, it's what, what you need to do your business. It's what you need to grow your business. So who says that? Well, actually, everyone here says that. And what I found is that um, it doesn't matter where you go to, that's kind of the first thing that people say in their first, gloss, first one or two sheets of their glossy brochure. But what does that actually mean? And it means the people and culture are the most important drivers for innovation. So that's easy, but when you actually turn around, you ask people the hard question, and you say to them, well, how's that going for you? Unfortunately, what they find is that's not going too well for them. Because if, is it, if it's really truly inclusive, then it means everybody in your whole organization is contributing and adding ideas. But what we're finding is we're finding pockets of people are actually contributing the ideas, and we're not getting that diversity that we thought we were going to be getting from, from the groups. So. Um, Generally, I cheat. I kind of try and find the answers very quickly, and the, there's two places that I go to. First is surely the people in universities, the people with white coats, will tell us what to do. And the simple answer is they will, of course, and there are actually master's programs you can go away and do, and they'll, they'll take you on a journey. They'll take, tell you about models, they'll tell you about processes, they'll tell you about tools. Um, they, you can even do a master's in um, innovation. So that's not good enough, that's not actually clean enough, I can't actually go through all of those. So Google, Google generally has a simpler answer. And so here you can see there are 463 million different hits. Don't worry, I, we won't be going through all of them here, but I went through them for you. And what I found is that there's actually two key things that you need to, to take away from all this. If you go through all this stuff, there are actually two fundamental themes that, that, are, that are in all this. But I can't just tell you them because if I told them, you'd forget. And part of my technical training approach is I have to tell you and then I have to show you. I have to explain it to you. So let's start with the first one. And the first one is stimulus and freshness and interest. And this is really important because um, not just yourself, but the people around you, they're going to have a, a body of knowledge. But what's, what's going to be What's going to work better for you is if they have a body of knowledge, but they actually look to other areas as well, and they look to other industries. And when they look to other industries, that kind of becomes a stimulus for them because that's where they get the ideas. So even taking a walk around here, uh, there's one or two things that I ran into that I didn't think I'd have any interest in, but actually it became a stimulus for something I might be able to use when I get back to work. So I've told you that, but now I have to prove it to you. Some years ago, NASA was looking at ways in which they could actually reduce the fuel consumption for commercial aircraft and for military aircraft. Um, and one of the concepts that they were looking at that came out of one of the universities was the idea of having, rather than having a smooth shape, actually a smooth surface, actually having a surface that was undulated. Um, they did some tests on their own in their own wind tunnels, and they came, came away from those tests finding that that concept did work. But then they thought to themselves, well, now how can we make this better? And one of the best ways was to look in nature. One of those areas, obviously, is in the water and with fish. First comes to mind, of course, is sharks. They have to swim most of their, they have to move most of their lives in order to basically stay alive. Um, they actually did catch some sharks, did some microscopic studies of the surfaces of their skin, and they found that those surfaces were not smooth. They actually were a series of very precise geometric uh, uh, shapes. Most people would figure that a perfectly smooth surface would be the best surface for having low drag. Interestingly enough though, what was found was that a, an engraved, micro-engraved surface does a much better job. After NASA had done their work, they, take, they took this work and they published it in a, in a, in a, uh, a publication called NASA Tech Briefs. This is a magazine that they use for transmitting their technology to the public sector that's not, not classified technology. Um, about the same time period, of course, also uh, the people at Sail America who uh, came to approach 3M 
what they want of actually using this particular concept when they're both competing in the America's Cup competition. And so we started working on looking at ways in which we could actually take it, turn it into a film system. They actually applied the film to their slower boat uh, and they actually ran their slower boat against the faster boat. And when they did, they found, to their surprise, that the slower boat was actually faster than the, than the actual boat they are planning to compete with. So just think about that for a second. You have all this stuff going on. You have NASA, you have 3M, the posted people, you have uh, uh, microbiologists and biologists, um, and then you also have um, yacht sailing. And each one of these are very diverse, but the only way that they actually ma managed to make it all connect was by looking into other industries, and by linking them, they were actually able to find something that would improve their own industry. So the next thing is protect, and um, this, is, this is one of the most important things that I found in this whole thing, is that ideas rarely form and are fully formed when they come out. Is that and someone says an idea, they have an idea, but it's very rarely implemented. It generally requires multiple iterations before that idea comes to something that is actually very usable. But the, the thing that you need to remember is that first idea is very small and it's very fragile and it's very easy to crush. And if you crush that idea, odds are you're going to actually miss out on a lot of exciting projects further down the line. So I've told you this, I now need to prove it to you. In the early 1990s, burglary was seen as the crime that everyone expected to be a victim of. Uh, the public were under the opinion that the police could do nothing about it, and indeed uh, inside the police as well, it was taken as being the norm. So we were faced with the position of wanting to turn around public perception both inside our own organisation and outside as well. But we were doing this against a back cloth of it being seen to be impossible to change, um, nothing more that the police could do was the generally held review. So we got a small group together and decided how we could radically alter people's thinking. And from there, one idea fed off another. I know this sounds a bit daft, but rather than us go after the criminals all the time, wouldn't it be great if they came to us? We were throwing out ideas that just months before would have seemed totally perverse and unachievable. And then one person feeds off another. And from there, the imagination kept running. And from these seeds of ideas, we started so we start back into the and started to say to ourselves, well, hang on a minute, why not? So now I'm just going to check with, uh, with Julie a minute. So it's about thinking out of the box. It's about um, bringing other people's ideas on board. And from there, Operation Bumblebee was born, and we started a series of initiatives. And that was, uh, we set up our own sting shops, which, and that involved uh, using operatives to run jewelers' shops and second-hand shops, set in the environs of, of places that were particularly prone to high burglary levels, and that uh, the burglars would sell their wares to us. And from the minute they left us with their property, we set about inquiring where that property came from and identifying who the sellers were. Police in London have raided several... So I find that incredible. I find that incredible. First off, and I hope you picked up on it, is that the guy who came up with the idea said, I know this is a bit daft, but... So he was already apologising for the idea that he was going to put out there. Next thing is, is can you imagine how easy it would have been to crush that idea in your normal corporate environment? Hey, I've got this idea. Uh, why don't we get the criminals to come to us? Even better, get the criminals to come to us, identify themselves, and even better than that, bring the stuff that they stole. Could you imagine how easy it would have been to turn around and say, that's a silly thing to do, we shouldn't be doing that, we've got to get sensible, what are we actually going to do on this? So, I know this is all well and good, but the question is, how is this going to change your culture? How is this going to improve your culture? And while there's not enough people here to do this, but anyway, what I was going to do was, I was going to basically ask people to pair up. And when they paired up, I'd ask them to look at one another. And when they look at one another, I'd ask them, that the people on this side, to give the people on this side a really big, happy smile. And what you'd see happen is a thing called uh, mirroring. And it's a psychological thing. And when you smile, 
you would find the other person would smile as well. And that's, uh, that's something that happens by default. And the reason we do it is because we want to be part of a community and we want to work together. And that means that my behavior has an influence on the people around me. So if I can actually take some of this stuff on board and actually act in a certain way, I know it's going to have an influence on the people around me. They're going to start acting in a certain way. That in turn is going to have an influence on the people around them. And so that's how we actually build out our culture and that's how we improve it. So the learning summary, and I need to make this very simple because it is very simple, is that um, step into the sun. Someone's got an idea. Stop. Pause for a second. It may sound absolutely stupid, but just pause. Because you need to remember that they've come to you with something that's theirs. It's something that's personal to them. And if they bring something to you and you actually crush it straight away, yeah, you get a chance to do that. They could bring you another one. And guess what? You get a chance to crush that as well. Do you think they'll bring a third idea or a fourth idea? Or no, of course they won't. They'll start to shut down. If they feel that the environment is hostile, or that you're not going to actually take them seriously, or you're not going to take what they're doing as something that could be of value. Second thing is, and this costs nothing, understand. Ask a couple of questions. So they've got the idea. So where did you get the idea? What made you think it would be important? What do you think the impact of it will be? Those sort of questions make sure that, and this is just active listening, this is kind of diversity and inclusion. This is the inclusion part of the diversity. Final thing is, is actually, if you're in creative mode, you should be trying to nurture it. Hey, that's an interesting idea. Have you thought about it could be used over here? Or what do you think about adding this to it? And that actually gives an opportunity to take that idea and see whether or not you can do that iterative process to actually build it into something that could be uh, ultimately realizable and ultimately turn out to be a piece of innovation for your organization. So in summary, I guess, this is the important thing. Companies don't innovate. Tools don't innovate. Processes don't innovate. None of them innovate. The people in your organization innovate. And you need to make sure you treat them in, in a way that they are actually feeling comfortable enough to say these ideas, to have these ideas, and to be treated with the right level of respect and dignity when they bring them to you, that they don't feel that they're uncomfortable bringing them to you. In, folk, in, in short, folks, and this was the, the, the piece to kind of go with this, is that you will ultimately see results if you do this. And it's not just me saying it, it's what the academics are saying. And that's what you'll find when you go through all the theories and you take a look at what's going on in the industry right now, is we're actually really signing up and you'll see a lot of stuff on uh, HR around uh, diversity and inclusion. And this is the reason why it's happening. A lot of people think it's just, hey, get the diversity in place. But the answer is no, you, you need to uh, realize the inclusion. Folks, that's it. Thank you very much.